Well, good morning, church. It's good to see all of you this morning. Nice to have you with us. Glad you all got the memo and nobody showed up uh, an hour early, um, even me. I, I, you never know when you got those time changes, so it's good to see all of you. Welcome. Uh, welcome to those who are worshiping with us online. We're glad to have you with us as well. Uh, let's give them a wave. Let them know that we're still connected, even though we're not physically present with one another. We're present spiritually, uh, <clears throat> and, and they're a part of this community as well. If you are online, please drop a hello in the comments. Let us know that you worshiped with us this morning. For those of you here in the sanctuary, good morning. Everything you need for the, uh, for the worship service will be projected on the screen. However, if you like to have something to hold in your hands, uh, we do have bulletins at the back of the sanctuary. Just flag down an usher and we can get you a bulletin. Uh, also, if you like to have the music and words, hymnals are there in the pews. And if you like to hold the word of God in your hand, we also have Bibles there in the pews as well, although everything will be projected on the screens. Uh, just a few announcements. So first off, uh, navigators will be meeting, I've got it here somewhere, I promise. There we go. Navigators will be meeting November uh, 13th at Biagi's, that's a Monday, at 5.30. If you uh, would like to attend or ha have questions, please contact Denny Bossard. Uh, his contact information will be, uh, will be shared, so please, uh, please let Denny know if you plan on attending. Um, also, Carrie Dancy asked me to announce that there will be a packing party set up. This is for our uh, OCC, Operation Christmas Child uh, project. So setup will be on the 17th at 5 o'clock, and then the party will be on the 18th, the packing party at 1 o'clock. And physical and financial assistance is still needed, uh, so please, if you have questions, reach out to Carrie. Uh, harvest dinner is coming up. Um, there's a sign up out uh, uh, or call the church office to, to get signed up. Uh, you'll notice also we're looking for coffee hour hosts and uh, nominees for the Presbyterian Women's Honorary Lifetime Membership. And then I want to put in a plug. Um, it's hard to believe, but in four weeks, Advent starts. Uh, <laughs> so we're getting ready for our Advent adult study. Uh, it is called Light of the World. It's based on a book by uh, Amy Jill Levine, who is the professor of New Testament and Jewish Studies at Vanderbilt Divinity School and College of Arts and Sciences. I had the pleasure of meeting AJ um, back in May at a conference. She is a dynamic speaker. Uh, she is the quintessential Jewish grandmother and so always wisdom, uh, always funny, um, always delightful. Uh, and, and this study is basically an, a beginner's guide to Advent. So we're going to look at Advent from a different perspective, from uh, the, the, the Jewish perspective, from the Hebrew stories and the New Testament stories. And Amy Jill is going to weave those together. So hopefully you can join us. Um, contact the church office if you would like to have us purchase a book for you. Otherwise, you can purchase the book on Amazon or Christian book distributors, something like that. There's no need to sign up for this study. Um, we'll have uh, uh, just show up. We're going to have groups that meet on uh, Sunday at 10 o'clock in the chapel down in this corner of the, of the church. We'll have a group that meets on Wednesday night at 6.30. 30, uh, and then we'll have another group um, that is full already, and we'll meet on another, uh, another night. So it's already uh, some excitement building with this. We hope that you'll get excited and involved and, uh, and see Advent in a little bit of a different way uh, this year. Uh, Sarah, you said you had an announcement? Good morning. 
This is just a quick announcement. I wanted to thank everybody for um, adjusting quickly for our event last week when we were supposed to have a food truck trunk or treat and we ended up having a soup lunch and, and Halloween party. Thank you to all of you who jumped in and helped by providing food and providing help in the kitchen and other ways. It really turned out to be a successful event but it was because of many hands making light work. So thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Well, let's take just a minute here. Presbyterians are social people, even though we're not very uh, uh, emotive or emotional during worship. We, we are very social people, and we like to greet each other. So let's take just a minute to reach out to the folks around us and offer the peace of Christ in whatever way is most comfortable for you, and then we'll turn to worship. Well, here at FPC, uh, we don't believe church is about uh, religion or uh, ancient doctrines, the way we traditionally think of those things. Uh, it's about relationships. It's about our relationship with one another. It's about our relationship with God. Uh, the most important thing we do as a community of faith is love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbors as ourselves. And that means all of our neighbors. Uh, we are an open and affirming and inclusive church. Um, so all are welcome in this fellowship. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what you've done, who you love. Um, this is a safe space. Uh, and that's what we want it to be. Uh, because I think we all bring questions. We all bring doubts uh, about things. And the best way to grow in our faith is to wrestle with those things together. Uh, and so that's what we do. It's okay here at FPC to ask questions. It's okay to express doubts. Um, in fact, I think um, that's a sign of, of wanting to grow more and more into the image of Christ. Uh, you know, people will tell you that if you have questions or doubts that it's a lack of faith. Absolutely not. It's simply a desire to grow and to know uh, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in a deeper way. And so bring your questions, bring your doubts. It's okay uh, to have those things. We, uh, um, we affirm the worth and value of all people here, so you will find no judgment, uh, only grace, love, and uh, acceptance. So please, reach out to family and friends. Let them know that there is a church that's different, that is safe space, uh, where they can be who they are. Uh, and bring those questions and doubts. Well, church, let's turn our hearts and our minds to worship as we stand for our opening hymn.
and you may be seated. And please join me in the morning prayer. Loving God, we come to worship today for many reasons. Some of us are here because it's where we always are on Sunday morning. Others are here because they need the renewal and inspiration your spirit provides to navigate another week. Some are here looking for community and friendship. Some come seeking your truth and the freedom it offers to set them on the path of faith. Thank you for this place and this time of worship. Forgive us, Lord, when we fail to acknowledge you in our lives, when we neglect your spirit, when we place our own wants and desires ahead of building the beloved community. In this time of worship, may we truly be present, attentive, and open to your movement within us and among us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. like to invite the children and youth and young at heart to come forward, please. Good morning, everybody. I want you to look up on the communion table and you'll see a bunch of candles up there. And the reason we have candles is because today is our All Saints Day celebration. And what All Saints Day is the day that we remember people in the church and in our families who have gone on before us. Because the church is not just made up of the people who are sitting in the pews right now, but the church is made up of all of the people who have come before us and all of the people who will come after us. And so on All Saints Day, we remember the people who have gone before. And so I was thinking about that, and I, I wrote an article in the newsletter actually about several people I, that have influenced me that have gone on before, but today I want to talk about my mom. So my mom and I were great 
travel companions. We love to go on trips together and do all kinds of adventures traveling. But one of the things I remembered about my mom this morning is that she helped me to appreciate the natural world. She helped me appreciate nature. And, and I know a lot of names of wildflowers because my mom taught me those names because she spent a lot of times in the woods when she was a kid. But the memory I wanted to share with you today was about a snake. So I found, I was out in my backyard and I found a garter snake. It was a small one and I wanted to catch it and take it to show and tell at school. And so my mom went outside with me and helped me catch that snake and helped me figure out um, a container for the snake and had cheesecloth over the top of it so the snake wouldn't get out at school. And she helped me take that snake to school. And I thought that was pretty cool. That made my mom pretty darn cool. She also helped my brother uh, raise caterpillars. He brought in a, one of those giant moths. It has the name that starts with C that I can't pronounce. And he brought that inside the house and they put it in a little box with, with kind of a nylon stocking over the top. And uh, the caterpillar laid eggs and the eggs hatched and all the little caterpillars crawled out of the stocking all over my brother's bedroom. <laughs> So, so she was a really good sport, and she loved nature and helped me to learn nature. And the other lesson she taught me was about hospitality. My mom always liked to have visitors at her house, and it didn't matter if our house was tidy and picked up and clean and spotless. She just liked to have people come over, and she didn't mind if they just made themselves at home and went to the kitchen and got a drink if they needed it or found a book to read or whatever. She was just glad that they were there and were with us, and, and she taught me about that hospitality. So I hope those are the lessons that, that I will continue to teach, and as I remember my mom, as she taught me how to be a nature-loving, hospitable Christian. Let's bow for a prayer. Dear God, we thank you for all of the people that have taught us wonderful things in our lives, and especially the people who have taught us about you and how to be a Christian in the world. We thank you for them, for their spirits, and for their lessons, and for the memories we have. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may go back to your seats. Well, as Sarah said, it is All Saints Sunday, um, so you'll notice the communion table looks a little bit different. Uh, we're going to have communion here in a little bit. Um, if you're worshiping with us at home, now would be a good time to get the elements ready uh, that you will need something for the juice and the bread. But uh, today we will light a candle in memory of each of um, the saints of FPC who have passed since October uh, of 2021. We're doing this about every two years now. Um, and those saints, as, as Sarah said, we learned something. Uh, from the saints that go before us and for the younger folks that were up here I guarantee at some point in your life You're gonna say something and you're gonna think Wow, I'm becoming my mom or I'm becoming my dad And you know what? It's okay <laughs> It's really really okay because uh, contrary to what you might believe sometimes your parents and grandparents and the folks older than you really do have some wisdom that's worth sharing. So, uh, Well, let's start with a quick round of Jeopardy this morning. And I apologize, I don't have this as a musical clip, so you're just going to have to listen to the lyrics. Uh, where do the lyrics... Um, or name the song these lyrics come from. Where have you gone, Joe DiMaggio? A nation turns its lonely eyes to you. This is Robinson. I heard it over here. Uh, bonus points for the artist. Simon and Garfunkel. Double bonus points if you can name the movie soundtrack. The Graduate. Very good. I'm impressed. Wow. Uh, now, you forgot to phrase any of that in the form of a question, so you all lose. But. Well, Paul Simon tells a great story about this song. Uh, he says that after the song was released, he got a letter from Joe DiMaggio in which Jolton Joe, a famous baseball player, expressed his confusion at the meaning of the song. 
DiMaggio wrote, what do you mean? Where have you gone, Joe DiMaggio? I haven't gone anywhere. I'm still around. I'm selling Mr. Coffee. Paul Simon ends the story by saying, obviously, Mr. DiMaggio is not accustomed to thinking of himself as a metaphor. But then I would say, who among us is? Do you think of yourself as a metaphor for anything? I mean, I'm Jim Langley, I'm a pastor, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a friend. Those are all straightforward descriptions of who I am in relation to the world around me. But if I woke up some morning and said to Kim, you know, I am your shelter from the storms of life, I'm going to get a pretty funny look. Or if I walk into the office tomorrow morning and I say to Karen, Karen, I'm the oil that keeps the FPC machine running, she might say, well, we're not going to worry about what Karen would say because I, I actually have a pretty good idea of how Karen would respond to that. Um, we don't usually talk about ourselves as metaphors unless uh, you're Jesus in the Gospel of John. Uh, or maybe Deion Sanders, if you've watched any of his press conferences. Uh, in the Gospel of John, we find seven statements uh, that, that Jesus made uh, about himself. They're often called the I am sayings of Jesus because each one begins with Jesus saying, I am, you know. Um, and, and so... Uh, since there are seven of them, this is what we're going to look at over the next few weeks. However, if you look at the calendar, you realize there are only a few weeks before Advent. So, uh, and I'm gone two of those. So we're going to start the series now. We're going to break for Advent and Christmas, and then we're going to finish it up uh, in the new year. And I promise we'll come back and recap what we talk about uh, now so that we're all on the same page in the first of the year. Um, you will also, one of the things I, I, I did this week, you'll notice in your bulletin there's a, a page with questions and places to write notes. Um, this is something new I want to try. If you appreciate it, if you like it, let us know so we know whether or not we should continue it uh, week to week. I have found that, that often it's, it's easier to remember things you hear if you have an opportunity to write them down and go back and look at them again. So we're going to try this for a while. Uh, well, let's offer a quick prayer, and then we'll dive into today's topic. Let us pray. Loving God, you call us through your word, both read and proclaimed, uh, to come to this place to be uh, followers in the world to carry with us the message of Jesus. May our eyes be opened and our hearts willing to follow wherever your spirit leads us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, over the course of church history, these I am sayings of Jesus have been the subject of some beautiful hymns, uh, some poetry, some stained glass windows, uh, and and they, they're so rich in meaning, I think, that sometimes we tend to just gloss over them. Um, we think we know what they mean. We think we know them uh, by heart. Uh, and and while, these, while these I am sayings have been a source of comfort for folks in a troubled word, world for generations, that wasn't always the case, especially for John's first century audience. Uh, if you go to the Gospel of John and read through these I Am sayings, you'll notice that um, there's a broader context to what Jesus is saying. And we're going to try and look at that broader context in this series. Uh, and many, in many cases, the statements John attributes to Jesus were actually pretty radical. Uh, and, and they landed Jesus in hot water. They got him in trouble. Uh, but that was the thing about Jesus. He didn't mind stirring the pot a little bit. He didn't mind uh, a little controversy. He didn't mind a little hot water. Um, after saying, I am the bread of life, uh, 
Jesus left most of his disciples scratching their heads. They complained that it was a hard teaching, uh, that nobody could figure it out. And, and actually, a bunch of his followers walked away because of this idea of him being the bread of life, and we eat the bread of, of life. Uh, when Jesus said, I am the light of the world, the Pharisees responded by telling Jesus that he couldn't illuminate anything or anyone and that he wasn't shedding any light on his identity. Uh, and then after claiming, I'm the good shepherd, the crowds denounced Jesus as a lunatic. Um, they said he was, uh, that he was possessed. And then after what I think is the most beautiful of the I am sayings, I am the resurrection and the life, well, at that point, the case against Jesus was sealed. The wheels of Roman justice started to turn that would lead to his arrest and crucifixion. Uh, and Jesus knew what was happening. He knew what he was doing, and he did it anyway. He kept preaching. He kept healing. He kept teaching anyway. Now, we're not going to look at the, at the I Am sayings in particular, or one of them uh, today. We're going to talk a little bit more about how Jesus taught, um, because I think it's important for us to understand. Uh, Jesus uh, taught in metaphor and parable, and, and we, have to, we have to have our minds wrapped around that as we read uh, some of the stories in Scripture. So we're going to go back to Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 to 35. Uh, it's on page 795 in those pew Bibles. Uh, if you don't have a Bible of your own, uh, we have some at the back of the sanctuary. Please feel free to pick one up and take it. That is our gift to you. We want to make sure everybody has, uh, has a Bible that they can use. Uh, that they can read through, that they can study. So yeah, please feel free to grab one of those. Uh, well, earlier in this chapter, in chapter 13, Jesus uh, told a parable about a sower. And when he was done, the disciples asked him why he taught with parables. Uh, and, and Jesus answered, but then Matthew brings it up again uh, in today's passage. And so... You know, when, when things are repeated in Scripture, usually it means that there's some importance there. Uh, and so um, that's why we're going to focus on, on the parables uh, and why Jesus taught with parables. Uh, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today in Matthew chapter 13. Jesus put before them another parable. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. That someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until it was, all of it was leavened. Jesus told the crowds all these things in parables, Without a parable, he told them nothing. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth to speak in parables. I will proclaim what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. So one of the first things I think we need to talk about is the fact that, that parables and metaphors kind of go hand in hand. Okay? Really, if you think about it, parables are just extended metaphors, right? Uh, unfortunately, the word metaphor, in some circles, when you bring it up when you're talking about scripture, uh, it makes people a little bit uptight. They don't like it, uh, especially biblical literalists. Uh, they hear you say metaphor, and they start to think, well, you're saying it's not literal, or it's untrue. Uh, and really, that's not the case. Um, when we're talking about metaphor and scripture, uh, what we're talking about is, are things that have more than a literal meaning or a more than literal meaning. That doesn't mean they're untrue. 
It just means there's a deeper meaning to them. Think of it this way. Uh, we often talk about God as having hands and feet and eyes and ears. Why? Well, because Scripture says that we are created in God's image. So we look at ourselves and say, well, God must have hands and feet and eyes and ears. And when we do that, what are we doing? Creating God in our image. Right? Does God have hands and feet and eyes and ears? Probably not. God is the ground of our being. Or when you think about the exile, uh, the, the Babylonian exile in the 6th century, we know from the historical record that actually happened. But if you read about it in the Bible, um, the authors give it a more than historical meaning. Uh, they, they add to it. It becomes a story uh, not just of Israel's exile, but a story of exile and return that we can all learn from. It's the human condition. Uh, it's how God fixes it, right? We're cut off from God. We're exiled from God. And yet we know at some point we will return to that relationship. Uh, now, don't even get me started on the book of Revelation as a metaphor. We'd be here all morning. Um, sometimes the only way we can talk about big theological concepts is with parables and metaphors. We just can't explain the, these things otherwise. Uh, there's a German novelist named Thomas Mann who once said, parables and metaphors are stories about the way things never were, but always are. I like that. Metaphors and parables are stories about the way things never were, but always are. Chew on that for a little while. Now, Jesus used parables and metaphors as a way to invite his listeners to see things in a new way. Uh, and then to see both reality and their own lives through that lens. And in the case of the I Am sayings, Jesus is inviting us to see the nature and character of God in a new way. Taken together, these parables and metaphors Jesus uses open up a new way of, of seeing God, a new way of seeing ourselves in that divine human relationship. The point isn't to read them literally or take them at face value, but to see with them, to see through them, to view our relationship with God and to view our lives with God through that lens. Many of the metaphors we'll look at in this series echo some uh, rich and deep Old Testament stories. Uh, Jesus calls himself the bread of life. It, it, it takes his listeners back to manna in the wilderness and God providing for the people. The light of the world takes us back to the light of creation. Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. It's a reminder that God uh, is, is our shepherd, Israel's shepherd, who led them through the wilderness into a land flowing with milk and honey. Uh, these I am sayings of John's gospel are a way uh, of saying that for us, for Christians, for Jesus followers, the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures and, and the Christian Scriptures, are reconciled in Jesus. And everything we could ever want, every good thing God uh, has ever promised is coming to fulfillment in Christ, in Jesus. That can only be true if Jesus is who he said he is. Divinity wrapped in the flesh of humanity. Many scholars have noted that the sheer number of times John Jesus refers to himself as I am is John's way of telling his listeners that Jesus is really the new Moses. You think about Moses in the Hebrew Scriptures. He was the Savior of of his people, the one who led them out of Egypt and into the freedom of the promised land. But this time, it's a new savior, it's Jesus. 
and not just a savior of Israel, but of the world. Uh, I am is an echo of the name God shared with Moses at the burning bush, Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. Uh, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. So this is important. It also means you're going to get a little lesson in uh, linguistics and ancient Greek this morning. So uh, let, the, let the head bobbing and, and, and snoring commence. Although, I think if you listen, you might find it interesting. Uh, in the Greek of the New Testament, it was not necessary to use personal pronouns like I or you or we or she or he. Uh, Instead, the ending of each verb indicated who the subject was. So whether it was I or you or we or she or he. Um, So when you read in an English translation of the Greek New Testament, something like, I say to you, or I am going ahead of you. In the original Greek, you don't find the specific word, for I, which is ego. Instead, it's attached to the end of the verb. Uh, But with Jesus, when he says, I am, he actually makes it very emphatic. He uses the word ego. Uh, He says, ego a me. I am. And if you think about it, and go back to that Exodus piece, it sounds a lot like Yahweh. It sounds a lot like the great I am of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the God of creation and the Exodus, the God who was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. At the beginning of the message, I said most of us have trouble thinking of ourselves metaphorically. Um, If you do like to think of yourselves metaphorically, schedule some time, uh, we'll chat in my office. Uh, Jesus didn't have that problem, Uh, not because he was a bit strange, but simply because he knew that within himself, within the fullness of God and the Holy Spirit, there is uh, a, a, a wisdom Uh, a multi-layered goodness and incredible power that that helps us understand who we are in relationship to God and who God is in relationship to us. Everything. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the, the light of the world. It all becomes a reality. And Jesus, and we see on a deeper level who God is and what the nature of God is. So um, if you don't know this Jesus, uh, I hope you'll join us uh, for the next message in the series and and after the first of the year because, um, you know, this relationship is important. Uh, There is truth and freedom found in knowing who this Jesus really is. And we want you uh, to come to that understanding, to come to that deeper relationship, and to get to know the great I am. Amen.
affirm our faith is to proclaim our belief in the truth and power of God's grace and love. I would invite you to join me as we speak the words of our affirmation of faith. We believe in the kingdom of God. We believe God speaks of the kingdom with parables and metaphors because some concepts are just too big to understand. So we believe the kingdom is like a mustard seed, insignificant yet growing into magnificence. We believe the kingdom is like yeast, insignificant yet expanding into enough bread for the world. We believe the kingdom is like a treasure, lost and insignificant until it is found with joy and thanksgiving. We believe the kingdom is like a pearl. All others become insignificant when the largest, most beautiful pearl is found. We believe in the kingdom of God, where the meek and the poor, the merciful and the hungry, rejoice in God's provision and grace. Amen. Friends, out of the abundance we have been given, let us humbly present our tithes and our offerings to our God. If you feel called and are able, offering baskets are located in the front and in the back of the worship space. Your offering can also be mailed to the church or dropped off in the church office. There is also a giving button on the FPC website. Your generosity and faithfulness are deeply appreciated. And now will you join me in the prayer of dedication. God, you call us to Christ's mission and ministry. Bless these gifts that they might spread the hope of your good news. Feed the hungry, shelter the poor, comfort the suffering, and free the captives. Bless us also so that our lives conform to radical love and faithful humility. Amen. We come to the table today not because the table itself is anything special, but because it is a reminder of another table in another place, a table that stretches as far as the eye can see, a table that is laden with God's good gifts, a table where no one goes hungry or sits alone, a table where everyone we ever loved and whoever loved us sits and eats together. In our own lives, we sit at tables where there are empty places, places that used to be filled by people we love. We grieve those empty places, but we also know that in Jesus Christ, our separation from those saints is only temporary. Now, a saint is not a perfect person. Uh, saints are simply people who know their deep need for God, who know that, uh, that they are sinners saved by grace, uh, and who have placed their trust in that grace, in that God. If you love and follow Jesus, you are a saint. So, uh, as we perform this ritual today, let us remember uh, who we are in Jesus Christ. Uh, saints set apart by God and for God. Let us remember our purpose, uh, to lead a devoted life, a life worthy of of the calling to which we have been called, a life which inspires faith in others, a life uh, ushering in the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Today we recommit ourselves to this life by first honoring the lives of those who have inspired us, the heroic and the humble saints who ran the race before us, the martyrs who sacrificed
for the sake of Jesus. And especially those whom we have known, have loved, and led us to Jesus and encouraged us to a deeper faith and service. This morning we will light 29 candles. 28 are for the members of First Presbyterian Church who have passed from this life into the next since October of 2021. The final candle we will light this morning is to remember other family and friends who have died. As the names are read, we invite you to think about the saints in your own lives, people whose memory you carry in your own heart. Let us remember the saints among us. Greg Hapgood, Wilma Habman, Bertha Long, Jack Barker, Iris Snyder, Richard Jacobs, Carl Foster, Reed Shadel, Ray Dean Airy, Jeanette Meyer, Russell Rhodes. Kent Baker, Abby Pumroy, Kenneth McMurray, Janice McMurray, R. Dixon Jennings, Helen Sheldon, Carlos Boyson, Gerald Henderson, Richard Snyder, David Gerber, Joan Snyder, Lorna McLean. Roger Flink, Ruth Harrison, Linda Arns, Carolyn Heights, Joy Schott. God bless all those who we have loved and keep them safe. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, for all those we have mentioned in your presence, we give thanks and praise. We come gladly to this table to eat once more with those we love, to join with all the saints, all our saints in praising Jesus Christ, who defeated death, who leads us all to God's heavenly banquet. Amen. Well, church, this table does not belong to you or to me. Uh, it does not belong to any church or denomination. There is no fence around this table to keep people out, uh, to keep out those people or the other, or people we see as less than because of who they are or where they come from or who they love. This is the Lord's table. This is a table of unfathomable grace and unconditional love. At this table, everyone is welcome. So come, eat, drink, and be filled. And let us pray. We give our thanks and praise to you, O God, Lord, the God of Abraham and Sarah, 
Miriam and Moses, Joshua, Deborah, Ruth, David, priests and prophets, Mary, Joseph, Peter and Paul, apostles and martyrs, and ordinary unknown saints. You are the God of our mothers and fathers and our children to all generations. Bearing your image, you fashion us into one people and continue to love us. Even when we deny our godly heritage, still you call us home to you through saints dedicated to your will. Blessed are you, most gracious God, for the gift of your Son, our brother Jesus Christ, who lived in accordance with your will to the point of laying down his life for the good news he preached and passed on to us. On the night of his arrest, he taught us how to serve one another in love with a ritual of table fellowship enjoyed by Christians of all times and places. And so, in remembrance of our Lord Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves with thanksgiving as a living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. We will live out the mystery of the faith we proclaim. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Spirit of the living God, make us one as we partake of these gifts of bread and cup with you and with all the saints. As we break bread together, may our eyes be opened to see your glory. As we raise the cup of salvation, may we be strengthened to follow your way. We pray today for the world you so love, we ask that you would speak your peace in places where wars rage and violence triumphs. Especially we lift up Ukraine, Palestine, and Israel. We lift before you our prayers for the health of all nations, that all people may flourish. We pray for those in positions of power over other lives, for the oppressed and those who are the oppressors. We pray for those who grieve, especially the family of Susan Knight. We pray for those who are sick, especially Matt Clausen and the niece of Dixie Jurgens. We pray for those struggling to live the fullness of your resurrection and the abundant life you offer. Send them the comfort only you can give. Forgive our sin, O oh Lord and work with who we are, where we are, to form uh, these clay pots into vessels of living praise so that our lives may participate in the same unending song of the universe raised by all your saints. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor and praise are yours, almighty God now and forever. Amen. Now, Lord, hear us as together we offer the prayer that Christ has given us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night before Jesus died, when he knew he would not be with his disciples much longer, he gave him a sign to remember him by. First he took the bread from the table, and after giving thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me.
Church, the one who claims us and calls us by name meets us as we eat of this bread. The one who loves us unconditionally and forever is present as we drink from the cup. So take the bread and the cup. In them, Christ comes to us so that we might come to God. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If our servers would come forward. begin with these outside pews. Uh, please come down the outside and then back up through the center. For those of you in this side, uh, just come forward, take the bread and the cup, and then head back up.
and let us pray. Jesus Christ, Lamb and Shepherd, we remember you here as we remember all your saints. Help us to remember you not just in the sanctuary, but in our homes and schools, our cars and our offices. Help us to remember that every part of our life is filled with your grace and that we are never alone, but surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, united by your love. Amen. Church, you are invited to join us downstairs in the social hall for coffee and fellowship. The stairs right back here uh, will take you right down to the social hall. Please join us uh, for a time of fellowship and conversation. Uh, and as you go, uh, take with you the grace and love of God that you might share it with those you meet each day. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen.